right, um, this isn't so much an interstate visit, but an intrastate visit. Um, we, when we ran the CubeSat uh, workshop here last year, Andreas came along and uh, gave us a presentation, but his work has progressed quite a lot since then. Um, mainly the reason I invited him today is because I missed his thing at Space Up. And I did the thing at Space Up myself, and then I saw he was doing it, and I thought, oh, too late, I missed that one, so I'll invite him along here to talk. And so, that's your game, right? You can get to see what he's doing. So, you're currently at University of Newcastle? Yeah. So I've got um, just a couple of subjects left over and yeah, nearly done. Okay, so still doing his undergrad, like some of you. Um, so let's have a look what he has to say about all of his CubeSat work. Yeah, good. Okay, let's go with this. <laughs> Alright guys, uh, for those of you who don't already know me, I'm Andreas Antoniadis um, from Newcastle. Oh yeah, and thank you very much for inviting me because, yeah, I, I love doing these talks and things like that. It's, it's always great to, to meet people that are keen in this field um, and do all sorts of exciting things with uh, space hardware. Um, so what I'm going to do today is basically have uh, just a, a brief rundown of what I'm up to, um, who I am, uh, who Obelisk Systems is, which is my startup, um, some of the, you know, the interesting things that have come up as far as uh, design, some of the challenges that have come up, uh, and where we're going to in the future sort of thing. And then um, all sorts of questions and just general discussion. Um, but there's like, there was two people, but now there's only one presenting in this one hour block, so we can kind of just chill. Yeah. What today? Oh, no, the other person's not Okay, all right, all right, sweet. So I don't have to rush. All right, anyway, okay, so, um, yes, so I'm Andreas, I'm from Newcastle. Uh, I've been studying uh, electrical engineering uh, and business for the past uh, five years um, as a double at um, University of New South Wales. No. University of Newcastle. Sorry. Um, yep, I'm the founder of Obelisk Systems, which is an embedded systems uh, hardware um, startup, and I'm a massive space nerd, uh, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Alright, uh, a bit of a rundown of some of the stuff that I have done as far as my experience goes, um, because yeah, I haven't really mentioned what I've done in the past. So I've actually had about three years experience working with really large like manufacturing and industrial uh, industries like uh, BHP, lost the coal, things like that. I did a lot of commissioning work. I did a lot of underground work with electrical systems, integration, uh, safety monitoring systems, traffic control systems underground, um, big um, uh, washery plant, things like that. Uh, that wasn't particularly um, a field that I was um, keen on pursuing mostly because it's not that exciting uh, and it's pretty much at its end here as far as you know development goes. Um, I've spent the last three years as the University of Newcastle Electrical Engineering Student Ambassador. Uh, while I did that, I actually uh, developed a whole bunch of educational programs um, for schools that come and visit, as well as when we go to schools. And that includes like um, code classes, robotics programming classes, all sorts of things like that. Uh, and even at one point we ran like this um, code um, like drill program that I developed which was like a military simulation we all just hoarded them into like a bunker with lights and things like that and I was a military general and we taught them all things about code anyway um, as part of that um, I also built uh, two electric vehicles a car and a motorbike uh, the motorbike was a full-scale um, Aprilia which we pretty much shredded from scratch so I've had a lot of like uh, experience with um, electric vehicles at the moment, I'm working with the Hunter Medical Research Institute as well uh, on the side. I do uh, web and learning um, communication specialists and also crowdfunding related things. So I've been doing a lot of that development, a lot of their website technologies as well. And for my honours thesis, which I completed um, last semester, I basically did the foundations of the Protosat, which is the educational satellite um, hardware. And with that, I did a lot of uh, work regarding uh, atmospheric, you know, properties and uh, orbital calculations, uh, power, etc., and all the considerations that are necessary, all the compliance that's necessary to meet. And then I built some prototypes. Um, here, are some, oh, here are some silly pictures. So that's the motorbike up there, which was a full scale motorbike. We got it going to about 180 kilometers an hour uh, for, I think, uh, two and a half hours runtime. So we basically just built this weapon of mass destruction, effectively. And that's me racing in the electric um, buggy more so than car. Um, 
that's me installing a transformer, and that is me with my satellite. Anyway, just some photos. Right, so moving on. I am no longer a single man team. As of last month, I'm actually a team of three, um, which is really, really good because I realized one morning that it was impossible to actually do all of this without, you know, probably meeting my early demise through fatigue and stress. So I've brought on an artist and designer, uh, Rosemary, and um, a colleague, uh, Lewis, who we did our honors thesis together. And I commonly refer to him as Thor because he's a power electronics god. Um, and yeah, he actually keeps me in line because he's also really, really good with testing. Uh, whereas um, uh, Rosemary's pretty much been doing a lot of the uh, direction timelining and she does some amazing artwork, so she's you know, really good to have on the team. And of course, this is me. I sit around doing nothing except for some embedded systems thing here and there. Um, no, not really. Uh, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> so, what do we do? We specialize in embedded systems hardware and educational products. Um, which is, the first one's obviously the flagship product, which is the Protosat, which is currently still under development, but it will be ready soon. Um, we design and manufacture CubeSat hardware, which is, again, part of the, um, the Protosat stuff. Uh, we work on custom payloads for CubeSats, which is something that we're also working with in conjunction with a small startup called CubeWriter. And also work on complete classroom education packages that includes teacher's guides, education guides, um, a whole bunch of like uh, programming manuals, things like that that all come together in a single package along with uh, custom hardware for classrooms. Okay, so I'm trying to tackle a few problems uh, with the current CubeSat environment and this is why the Protosat came into existence in the first place. Hardware costs for CubeSats are, as it says, extreme. They are massive, like you're looking at around $200,000, $250,000 alone just to have a complete launch guaranteed with commercial hardware into space, everything done and dusted, you know, with all your hardware and everything accounted for, insurance, blah, blah, blah. I don't like that. It's too expensive, especially given the hardware is often like more than half of that. Um, programming difficulty, generally speaking, for like University students, uh, well, low-end university, like early university students, first and second year, and especially uh, high school students, is impossible. Um, kids like these days, they need to be stepped into the hard stuff. So I figured, you know, we need to target the fact that programming difficulty itself is challenging, especially with real-time operating systems and a lot of like mission-critical stuff that kids would have no idea about. So that needs simplifications. Physical layouts and integration is also extremely complex. It's difficult to physically see what's going on. And part of the difficulty in, in learning electronics, embedded systems, and CubeSat stuff is being able to see exactly what's going on. And it is immensely complex. I mean, there's obvious reasons for that, um, like physical reasons for that. Um, but it can be simplified further if you're working on a more robust, simplified design. And it's very hard to find a complete learning system and full documentation for a particular module um, because, yeah, they, they, just, they just don't exist. Like, especially like a complete learning system that shows you how to code, how to set it up, etc. It's just not a thing. Okay, so from there, I wanted to basically fix that. And that's where my honest thesis kind of began. Um, and then I started with something called yeah, the Protosat system. So this is what I'll be talking about predominantly. So it is a classroom uh, and space grade affordable CubeSat. Primarily, first first run will be a classroom um, like grade, I suppose. Grade, yeah, like robust enough for a classroom environment, teaching environment. Um, it'll be well. It is 100% CubeSat compliant, so we're meeting a lot of like international compliance. We're meeting um, like all the stuff that NASA requires, all the stuff that maybe like the European Space Agency has as far as guidelines for construction. But most importantly, the uh, Cal Poly CubeSat standard and how that's evolving over time. And also QB50. So I've tried to actually bring some inspiration from QB50 and see how they've done their stuff as far as, and also the compliance is necessary to meet the QB50 guidelines, um, which you guys are assuming know about. I don't know all that much about it other than the compliance docs, but yeah, so it meets compliance basically. Um, I'm trying to get the cost around about $1,000 uh, for 
power, um, telecommunication, the whole thing. Just all in one little sandwich, happy little one unit cube set. Um, and that's proving to be a little bit difficult given the state, the state of the Aussie dollar versus the US dollar. Um, I'll talk more about that in like the challenges, but yeah, it's, it's been very, very challenging. And that price will probably have to go up a little bit given the fact that the Aussie dollar is falling so fast in comparison to this, with the American dollar. Um, we use like larger but less efficient um, solar panels. The reason that's done is because when you're looking at a 28.7% efficient solar panel, it's costing you around $1,000 per side and easy, maybe close to $10,000 for just a cube set, just to get those solar panels. When you think about it, the total, total surface area of the solar panels is big. It's going to cost you like 10 grand. It's crazy. And for a classroom, you don't really need that. You just need you know, some big solar panels that are you know, covered in plastic that can be chucked around. The students are going to inevitably be dropping and touching these things with their dirty fingers. So you go with bigger ones, less efficiency, and when you're looking at like, like even 18% to 20% efficiency, it's so cheap to get them mass manufactured and distributed. So there's, yeah, there's no question about it. Um, we want to provide extensive documentation. Absolutely everything. Full circuit diagrams, everything. How to set it up, because there's a lot of stuff that's often missed when it comes to education systems. Um, and even online, when I try and find some information about like the big, the big guys that are doing the CubeSat solutions at the moment, there's just yeah, not much information out there. And in addition to that, providing uh, code and hardware examples because um, yeah, you want to be able to get started really, really quickly, and that would include like, libraries, a CD-ROM full of everything, and that's what we're currently working on. Um, bit of a summary of the ProtoSat modules that come together. That picture there is my very, very first like ghetto sat prototype. Um, it had like the very foundations of um, a CubeSat. It was a 3D printed chassis with some basic electronics and an antenna deployment system, antenna detection, stuff like that. But again, it was a it was a prototype just for the for the honest thesis. Um, so as far as the modules go that we're developing, we're working on a, like a, a proper electrical power system to pull uh, and regulate power from solar panels um, and then distribute to like common buses like 3.3 volts, 5 volts and a customizable like user voltage for say certain scientific payloads that need a specific voltage to operate. Some things require very weird voltages like 20 volts or something like that. Um, a full telecommunication system, so um, uh, basically a full duplex UHF uh, with double redundancy um, transceivers uh, and also a telecommunications beacon so you can track the thing at very, very low power. Um, that's one thing that I'm pretty happy with as far as the design progress is going because um, the board itself actually, you can have the transceivers on board and if one of them fails, dynamically reprogram the first transceiver to become a transmit receive. And that, I figure, is pretty much, you know, it's pretty important to have given I haven't, I haven't really seen that anywhere else. And it's fairly easy to do for a low cost with commercial off-the-shelf parts. Um, the Beacon Experiment System is another board that was part of the, uh, the Honest Thesis that I, that I worked on. Um, it's pretty much the beacon that will be on the telecommunication system, but very much simplified. Uh, and onboard computer using an STM32 or uh, an AT Mega. At the moment, the STM32 is pretty much what we're thinking of using because it's just a much better chip. Uh, and a science and data acquisition system. Uh, science and data acquisition system I'll talk about in depth later because it's a bit more, um, yeah, it's, it's the current active thing that we're working on. Uh, and it's pretty exciting, actually. Um, so, what I started off with was like a couple of 3D, like a couple of electrical concepts. So I did all the design work, etc., and uh, you know, all the compliance comes together, uh, the design comes together, and you end up with a product that you're ready to manufacture. So I built some prototypes, and um, they came out looking pretty much exactly the same as the uh, the renders, which is which is good. Uh, that's what you hope. Uh, and they worked really, really well. So it was really, really promising as far as the electrical power system and the beacon development board. I've actually got them here today. Um, so you guys can have a look later on. Um, 
but yeah, so as far as like first iteration hardware goes, um, it's been pretty pretty good so far because um, yeah, the theory actually is conf like confirmed in, in the hardware and it worked quite well. Um, I achieved a 94.5% efficiency on the power distribution and solar charging board, which is pretty good for something that was hand soldered. Um, and the telecommunications beacon works remarkably well uh, and is USB programmable um, and it's quite robust. I tried to break it, I tried to short pretty much every terminal and see what happens and it still goes. So that's a good thing. Um, right, so again, moving on to the objectives of what I've been trying to do and what you know, is, the, is the general progress of the ProSAT project. Um, I want all software to be as open source as possible and it's necessary in an education environment. Uh, when it comes to like teaching and things like that, if you're using a Raspberry Pi core or an Arduino core or anything to do with or any of your microcontrollers or any of the layers of the CubeSat, if it's going to an educational environment, you don't want them losing their minds purely in the programming because the reality is they're not actually going to be building the hardware from scratch. That's beyond them. That's why we're here. They want to learn how to integrate, they want to learn how to access all the sensors, things like that. And if you go online, you say, how do I use temperature sensor Raspberry Pi? <sighs> Millions of results. And the kids can do that. Everyone's got access to Google. And we include a whole bunch of uh, open source code as well. We don't need to worry about it. Um, so that's why, yeah, as far as the main microcontrollers, they all are Arduino compatible. Uh, but with you know, programming headers to make sure that the more advanced users can get down and dirty with the timers, with the registers and everything like that as you would with assembler if you're crazy enough, or C++, etc. C, more importantly, yeah, embedded C, etc. Um, simplified hardware layouts. Um, I like to keep all the actual uh, boards as far as functionality goes for a classroom, and this is another important part, in those, in, in visual logical blocks separated with silk screen. Just go back quickly. If you have a look here, the actual functions are separated uh, with silk screen, silk screen to indicate the different parts of the board. I felt that was a really, really important thing to do because it lets kids, A, see exactly where things are flowing on electrical hardware and learn more about it, but also gives me the ability to physically isolate systems uh, for um, safety, and also for the sake of, if a kid says, oh, if a kid goes crazy or something and drops a screwdriver and shorts out the um, one of the solar char charges and blows it up, they can just disconnect that one block. And what that means is they don't have to go and spend another thousand dollars to buy a kit or buy a replacement board because they just can keep going with what's left until, until nothing works. I don't know. Like, you know, they can just have like the 12 volt rail connected by the, but you wouldn't want to do that. But the thing is, yeah, by able, having everything isolated um, gives that extra sense of security, gives that extra flexi flexibility, and it makes it easier to learn and test things as well uh, with multimeters and oscilloscopes, things like that. Um, it has to be very robust for a classroom environment, as you guys have probably already gathered. Um, like I said, independent zones for every function, everything needs to be protected like as far as current protection goes. Uh, the best way to do it for cost is to actually use like um, passive protection like fuses, things like that. Um, but there's also the option for active current monitoring using uh, active current switches, things like that, which go to the microcontroller. Giving the flexibility for both means that uh, lower end users, say year sevens, year eights, that might get hold of this hardware, might not understand how to trigger and program active current and active power protection, but they still have the, like, the self-resetting fuses that are on the hardware to prevent them from doing anything drastic. Uh, and that's why all that, that has been included in almost every single design, particularly with the power, like with the power system. Um, the next revision of that board, which I haven't got with me, um, it actually has active, yeah, active current monitoring and passive current monitoring to make things as safe as possible. And of course, physically hardened, like really, 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 really physically hardened, so I can just drop it and it'll be fine, or I could set fire to it and it'll be okay, sort of. Uh, and also large tolerances on every voltage, 
on every bus, on every single pin, has to be like triple what the data sheet says. And that's been a big challenge as far as design goes because um, being able to handle, um, or actually being able to choose parts that have those tolerances that work in conjunction to each other is a bit of an engineering challenge. And uh, an example I can give is um, voltage swing on a microcontroller. You want to be able to have something that is like, you know, has a, a fair amount of voltage swing as far as the input to the microcontroller uh, lines go. But at the same time, you know, it, it's difficult to do that without the other components around it being affected adversely by the whatever's providing the, the voltage to that. And it's just this massive puzzle uh, of everything trying to fit into everything. So that's been a bit of a challenge as far as the design goes as well. Um, and as I said, um, you know, with regards to programming, keep it simple, but also give the ability to be uh, flexible. And again, like I said in the past slide, extensive documentation, because without documentation, it's pretty much just a piece of like silicon. Okay, so one thing that I really, really want to talk about um, that's like the big, the next big thing is the science and data payload. Uh, and it's something that's been under development uh, for the last couple of months now. It's been building actually longer than that, probably closer to six months. Uh, and it's building up pretty fast. It's in conjunction with CubeRider. Solange is here from CubeRider. So this is a plug for her as well. Um, what we're actually doing is, in conjunction to the actual embedded systems hardware, the power, the telecommunications, the processing, you really want to have a payload with sensors, um, a camera, you know, data acquisition so you can get real like, live data that you can play with. Because the reality is, um, it's a bit boring to just have a, you know, a CubeSat continually transmitting, yay, I'm here, yay, science, like, you know, there's, no, there's nothing to it. So we wanted to develop a payload that goes on top of it and it actually runs a Raspberry Pi as the computer on the payload that the students are able to write programs for. Um, the payload board actually has an enormous amount of sensors, an enormous amount of data, data acquisition um, hardware in general, protection hardware, etc. Uh, it's designed to take like magnetic data, accelerometer readings, um, temperatures, um, UV, uh, infrared, uh, ambient light detection, uh, a camera for being able to send stuff back, um, it, you know, by uh, the telecommunications module, and a whole bunch of sensors basically all come together onto this one board. Like I say, it totally doesn't look like this. It's just a concept sort of thing to show how a Raspberry Pi will sit on a CubeSat board. Um, but yeah, the idea is to make it a 100% CubeSat compatible. Um, with many sensors to interface with and provide it with an enormous amount of code um, and most importantly as an education kit. So the idea is that with CubeRider um, what we're actually looking at doing is uh, getting this particular board as a full development kit into classrooms with extensive documentation so they actually can learn how to run experiments on the Pi which is then obviously sent to the other data modules and then communicated back to Earth. But the idea is to sell it as a kit that also funds a ride-sharing program, uh, which will also fund a launch into space. And what it means then is that all the software that the students have written from these classroom kits will go onto this one Pi, or they'll be being done experiment by experiment. And the cost, of the, the cost of the kit actually allows them to uh, have a 20-minute experiment window. And the 20-minute experiment window lets them interface with any sensor that they want for a certain data throughput based on what their telecommunications like modules can handle. And what it means is they can actually get that code that they spent forever experimenting on in class and interfacing with the sensors and get real space data for a very, very low cost. Um, we are looking at was it thousand dollars for the basic kit. Yeah, yeah so the, the basic kit, yeah, includes the board, uh, full comprehensive manual, teacher's manual, multimeter, cables, the Raspberry Pi itself, <coughs> um, everything, a complete box, and we're trying to get those out to schools and potentially universities as well, um, because yeah, it just basically means that we can get a lot more people involved in the space hardware 
and it also means that we get the financing to move on to the next iteration of hardware and get the full CubeSat hardware into schools. So that's what we've been working on at the moment as far as the science and data payload goes. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been pretty crazy actually. Like as, as far as as far as the uh, development goes, it, it's coming along really well now that I've got um, Rose and Lewis on the team, um, especially with Lewis because he's a hard ass and he makes sure that I you know, meet my targets as well because I'm busy with all the other things too. And yeah, hopefully um, come February, we'll actually have these rolling out to schools uh, with code being developed uh, and then uh, July we want to have the code finished in schools. Depends on what negotiation. Yeah, it depends on yeah, it depends on launch uh, negotiation. You know, the kids have time to actually develop that code, run the experiments, and then it all comes to us, and it all comes to Cube Writer, and. Um, it probably all just get put into a cube, not being dealt with lots of license, you know, and yeah. executed. Yeah, and then yeah, the experiments are run, they get their data, everyone's happy, and then we move on to the next, the next cool thing. Um, all right, I'll talk about some of the, de yeah, the design challenges. Um, meeting compliance was probably the most important and most difficult one. As far as CubeSat compliance goes, um, I didn't realize the scale at which you know, it goes, because you've got your CubeSat compliance, like as far as like, what's defined by Cal Poly, but then you've got, like, about this big. The more you dive in, the more compliance becomes identified. And like, I'm going to do this electrically, physically, you have to deal with radiation testing, you have to deal with um, vibration testing, thermal testing, you've got to make all those, you've got to make sure, um, yeah, all sorts of um, compliance, the physical dimensions have to be correct because I actually want all of my CubeSat hardware, any board that I've developed, to actually be compatible with commercial counterparts as well. Um, and if I don't meet compliance, I can't do that. So that's been one of the big ones. Um, mass manufacturing techniques actually caught me by surprise by how in depth it is. Going from prototypes to developing uh, like a 500 unit production uh, has been probably one of the biggest challenges so far. Because it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, you have to get specific board characteristics. Uh, you need to actually have all sorts of um, considerations with <coughs> the automated machinery. The pick and place machinery, which basically will do the mass manufacturing run, requires specialist uh, reels. You have to make sure that the manufacturers are aware of exactly what you're doing. Uh, you have to have to be aware of the positioning, um, and it's generally a very, very expensive process too. I'd say it's probably about a quarter of the total manufacturing costs um, of everything for the 500 units. Um, it just it just gets bigger and bigger. I think the quote that I got for 500 units purely for manufacturing was close to, like just the automated pick and place, because it's such an involved process, was close to $20,000. And if that goes wrong, and one of my ICs is the wrong way, well, that's 500 duds I've got. So that's why it's been very, very challenging to actually get all the routing correct, get the reels aligned correct, make sure that the parts, you know, fit. I'd have the footprints on all the boards designed and everything correct, so that's been a big challenge. The costs, as I mentioned, are immense and given the potential to screw up as far as it's the first ever thing I've ever done as mass manufacturing, which is really, really scary. Um, and also fundraising. The thing is, is that, you know, before I can actually send these things to mass manufacturing, a lot of money has to come in from pre-sales of the units um, and, uh, you know, we have to have a guarantee to people that we'll be able to deliver um, the boards come February. Um, and that's been interesting as well, as well, delegating um, the funds for that. <coughs> I mentioned this sort of with the blocks earlier regarding the physical layout, but I came to the if issue where if something's visually like logical, having the blocks <coughs> electrically, physics says no. I said, what are you doing? Like, why, why would you have it in blocks when these two modules clearly need to be right next to each other to function? But I said, well, no, because you know I really want to have the ability for the students to isolate the individual blocks. Uh, within the microcontrollers, within the, within the CubeSat boards. And as far as actually electrically designing that, it's been a big challenge, especially with telecommunications. Because you've got uh, trace sensitive components. Um, when you're dealing with uh, things above 100 megahertz, it is literally black magic. Like there's, there's no other word for it. it is, 
I don't even know. It's, it's crazy, especially at higher frequencies, 437 megahertz, which is approximately what we're operating at for the main transceivers. Things re get really icky. So for me, as an electrical engineer, the biggest challenge has been to pull together the last like five years of my uni stuff and all my embedded systems stuff and actually try and get those logical blocks to actually still work. And they do. The power board works, so I did something right. Um, meeting uh, like international uh, like environmental compliance is also an interesting one. You've got your ROHS, uh, like the hazardous substances. You've got REACH in Europe, which is to do with your lead-free, your toxic chemicals, things like that. And there's ITAR, which is the, um, the American weapons, um, is it firearms? I can't remember the, anyone know what ITAR stands for? International yeah. Trade something, something? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> International <laughs> Trafficking. And arms regulation. Arms regulation, that's the one, yeah. And that, that's interesting because when you go to South America, things like that, there's a whole bunch of compliance that comes through. And you're like, whoa, I'm building a satellite, but not building a bomb. And they're like, no, you're definitely building a bomb, and you have to prove to us that you're not. And that's been quite interesting because, I don't know, there's no bomb component. Well, there is, I suppose, like, except for the explosives. <laughs> but yeah, as far as the, like um, keeping everything lead free, uh, you just can't sell to Europe anymore if there's any lead in electronics, they say go away. So that's been good uh, as far as um, actually finding new manufacturing processes and uh, componentry, things like that, especially uh, when negotiating to China with their uh, fabrication houses for PCBs to make sure that you're dealing with someone that deals with something that gives you the certificates to prove that it's entirely lead free, that the manufacturing the process is pure, etc. Because the boards are inevitably gonna be tested. If they fail the testing when they're out in the world, I'm in big trouble. So that's been an interesting challenge. A lot of phone calls, a lot of you know, translating and things like that. Uh, like I said before, the vibration, radiation, and thermal testing, challenging. A, it's expensive. B, things behave way differently to my initial designs, especially when you start checking them about. Um, I haven't had access to radiation testing yet, but I've been in talks with a couple of companies that do that um, but basically yeah actually designing the PCBs and designing the hardware that goes into the satellite stuff uh, to be able to withstand uh, single event upsets which are basically radiation um, causing uh, unwanted characteristics from transistors like triggering the wrong way things like that um, is interesting you have to find a way to mitigate that either by having multiple <coughs> units on board for redundancy purposes or having every single board as a supervisor to every single other board to check for latch ups and things like that, checking watchdog timers. Basically, yeah, that's been another thing that, uh, that I faced as far as design challenges. Um, but um, yeah, I suppose when you start actually, um, when you start piecing things together slowly as far as um, monitoring and all your current paths and, and all your your data lines, etc. It eventually becomes like second, second old. Like you just get used to it. You, you get used to it. But, uh, thermal testing is interesting. There's no uh, convection in space, and that's hilarious because everything just forms a bubble of heat around the parts. So because I've been designing it to not only be classroom friendly but also be space friendly, so when the final designs are finished, I can actually start, you know, providing hardware that people can can buy and put in rockets. Uh, you've got to deal with all the thermal dissipation. And normally that happens through the PCB. So what ends up happening is, you know, you have to have the radiation um, and, and contact thermal that dissipates through the PCB into space. Otherwise, if the designs aren't correct, you end up with these heat bubbles around the components that doesn't go away and you just end up cooking whatever is in that localized area. Uh, and it might not be much, it might be like, a quarter watt power dissipation, but in space, that kills you real bad. And that's been part of the, um, that's been another challenge that I've faced, um, but have overcome with a lot of, a lot of maths and a lot of simulation. Um, and of course, final product design, which pulls everything together, having to micromanage every single other one of these, it, yeah, it, it gets hairy. Uh, you need to make sure that you're, you know, tracking everything, you have to have timelines, you're going to have all sorts of fun things like that to make sure that everything comes together. 
Um, but yeah, I think um, I'm on on track. Things are coming along really, really well. From where I started, which was just this, just an unknown field. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. By talking to a lot of people and reading every night about everything, you, you kind of slowly start building up. So, our place in the stars. Where is Obelisk Systems wanting to be in the next few years? The first thing is getting the, those development um, systems that I'm working with in conjunction with Solange and CubeRider uh, to schools. I want that to be done and dusted in February so we can actually start having kids experimenting, start playing with the hardware. Uh, getting the prototype to schools and universities is next after that. Now that I've got Lewis on board and, and, um, and Rosemary on board, uh, production and design has actually been a lot faster, which means that uh, you guys, if you want to buy a prototype kit to tinker around with without worrying about spending $100,000 on hardware, more than welcome to when it's ready. Um, and then of course, uh, going from classroom grade to space grade, which is the next big challenge because there's a few components that just don't work um, that I have to change over, and that's going to be the yeah the next step, and then getting space heritage. That's the expensive one. Pretty much any profit that I'm going to make from everything above here will go back into getting space heritage. So putting these suckers into orbit, and that is the that is the real test. That is the real test for hardware for space hardware space heritage. If I can actually say, hey, my hardware works in orbit, this becomes so much easier. Because people say, oh, okay, he's flown it and it works. It must be actually something. So, yeah, um, that's later down the track, but it's a very important part. Um, yeah. So, that was my little spiel. Um, from now, basically, I'm just going to keep working hard with a team of three. Uh, things are coming along really, really well. Um, I was considering doing a PhD, um, but the thing is, is that if this is going to be <laughs> taking up most of my time, I might have to put that on the back burner for a couple of years. But ideally, I'd like to come and do a PhD on some, on some space stuff um, and just expand upon what I did for my own thesis. So yeah, that's about it. <laughs> here as well so you can like come and have a look ask questions etc later on but yeah I'll just open up to any question you want anything what's my grandmother's shoe size whatever you know like anything <laughs> how were the how were the lead times when you were getting those PCBs prototype for the PCBs that I did for my honest thesis nine days from where from, from China. China. China nine days I sent the Gervers uh, and I actually had to make a revision for the first board within five minutes and then 10 minutes later, I got an email saying, it's on the way to the factory. I was like, whoo, I'm glad I picked up on that error. The board was mirrored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, really, really fast. Uh, that's Who do you use? Um, first one I did was dirty PCBs. Oh, yeah. Really, really good if you pay for the expert Dirt shipping. Hmm? Dirt cheap. Dirt cheap PCBs, yeah, it's like dirtypcbs.com, I think. Yeah, really, really, really good. Um, and also, um, OHS Puck. Are really good too but yeah basically as far as the PCB manufacturing goes it's at the stage now where if you're going lead boards two layer 10 by 10 centimeters it's 75 bucks you'll have it in nine days it's done so easy so I've got I've got so many prototype boards I use them as coasters at home. Like legit my desk is this coaster anyway more questions the one you at the moment one you yes, one you just for the sake of keeping it simple. But I mean, from there, it can definitely expand, especially if you want to run multiple payloads. It all comes down to the performance of the power supply. The EPS board and how much power I can get out of the, that thing um, really governs whether I can go to a two you. But the way that I'm designing is actually just <coughs> to be able to stack two of the same board together and just double the current capacity. Yeah, just to just make it just modular. What kind of launch costs, costs are you looking at? Launch costs are pretty pretty expensive. I think Solaris could probably answer that question better than me. Mostly because I'm dealing with hardware more than launch costs. But it is in excess of, what, 100,000? Depends who you go with. Yeah. If you're in Australia and trying to launch in America, yeah? The price is going up. Yeah. For CubeSat launches. It's going up? Yeah, for 
demands there. They're going to make money out of you. <laughs> Nano racks is about eighty-five thousand cube. Mm. For for an American. For American. And considering it's like what, like eight thousand dollars per kilo in general, when you think about it, like general like cost of, of launching in bulk, and the cube set is one kilo, you're like, why is it that expensive? It just doesn't make sense. Mm. The cost of the launch is basically why um, so many cubes that's not actually get launched. Yeah. Um, yeah. America it doesn't seem to be going down. It's, the quotes keep getting higher. But other places are starting to come up. Exciting questions, random questions, things you didn't quite understand. Thanks very much. It's just really interesting. I don't know if you've got the technical, but I'm interested in the educational aspects of it. So do you have contracts for to get into schools in Peru with individual schools? Or? So I'm not personally doing the contract side of things. What I'm doing is I'm going through Cubo. Uh, Cubo. So I provide the hardware to Cubo, oh, okay. and then we go from there. So that, <coughs> that saves me a lot of a lot of more insanity, and they don't have to worry about hardware. So it's a win-win for both of us. Yeah. Do you have any ACDS or Target acquisition? I saw that. Um, well, I'm going to use the, 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 that's the one thing that I'm actually battling with at the moment. I want to be able to, because I've got space for it, as far as the one unit goes. Um, ACDS is probably one of the most important things, especially for the camera. And I'm just like, oh, I took a picture of space. Great, there's nothing there, it's just black. Uh, yeah, um, as far as it goes, I think the problem is mostly it comes down to my general understanding. Um, I know a lot about the other modules and how to you know, go about designing them, but as far as ACDS goes, it's, just, it's a very foreign field to me, so I'll probably have to bring someone on to be able to do that. But it is in the it is in the course. Get a question? No. Yes. Yeah. Um, you said um, single event upsets was a problem. Do you have any um, plans at the moment to have to address that? Uh, yeah, the, base, the easiest way to do it is a hard reset. Okay. Yeah. But, um, so the EPS board has my <coughs> controller on it, well the new version does, and that will monitor um, all other buses uh, and all other boards to, 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 ch to check for any like, like particulars, any unusual events, things like that. And then it will just do a hard reset, especially of comms and the processing module, they're the big ones, they're the ones that are most susceptible to it I'd say. Uh, as far as the power board itself goes, while it is vulnerable, um, it is a lot more robust purely based on how the power electronics, like the power electronics on their design, especially the chips I'm using, are actually like ready designed to for you know moderate protection against uh, uh, single event upsets and radiation issues. But it also has a comms line to the processing module that lets the processing module reset the power board. So yeah, it just resets the microcontrollers and the watchdog timers do most of it. Yeah. Just to comment, we've got some funding from the ARC mm -hmm. to look at um, uh, FPGAs, processes, and they can reconfigure themselves mm -hmm. in real time so that you don't actually have to reset. Yeah. You just do, you, you, you know, inside the FPGA you have redundant circuits. If one gets affected by an SCU, you just yeah. take that one out, reconfigure it, and start again. Yeah, it sounds good to me. Um, the way I'm addressing that, and they're working on um, CubeSat boards. Oh, sweet! To do to do that. Okay, I'll have to, yeah, I have to talk to them as well. Um, but how we're getting around it with the microcontrollers actually just having two microcontrollers. The uh, STM32s, the new versions of the STM32s, are so like power efficient that I can afford to have two of them, one of them running in a, in a low power mode and, and just swap between them if one of them fails or if one of them becomes latched up. Yeah. So that's how it's, we're getting around it at the moment. What funding opportunities are you trying to get on board at the moment? Uh, I'm looking for some just small scale stuff that doesn't involve like, you know, giving away too much uh, equity, etc. Because, right. yeah, but the thing is, I'm, I'm relying a lot on pre-sales, mm. um, especially Writer for the first the first run for the little um, pie board. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely uh, the money that will come in from that will help fund that yeah that first production run and then like I said the the small amount of, of profit that we make from that we'll be able to go back into the development of the cube.
Creative Surf Awards and pay my staff. Yeah, who yeah. are currently doing everything for free. <laughs> yeah, they're almost self-funding right now. I'm hemorrhaging money. Yeah, like all the money that I've saved up for the last like three, four years is like mm. thousand bucks here, prototypes here, <laughs> testing ten thousand. Yeah, it's it's. You never have holidays, so no holidays. Yeah, no. that's all right. So I'll just go for a drive down to the beach. <laughs> that's my holiday. Yeah, so that's how it effectively self-funded up until first run. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's risk free in this guy. Well, risk for me, but not for other people around me, sort of thing. Like, so I'm trying to mitigate risks as much as possible because it's such a vulnerable environment too. And you know, I don't want to die before I even make the first prototype. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. More questions? <coughs>